Well, as we move again into John's Gospel, into this fourth chapter, let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, as we do every Sunday, because it's just a great joy and a delight to be able to read your word and to be able to reflect upon it together as your people. And Lord, as we look at this next chapter, in chapter 4, Lord, continue to speak your truth to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the uh, Narnia stories, written by C.S. Lewis, who's all read the Narnia stories? Most of you should have read Narnia. Who hasn't read the Narnia stories? Oh, dear. Lacking in your literary reading. But in the Narnia stories, written by C.S. Lewis, Aslan, the lion, is the Jesus figure. Aslan is the one who redeems Narnia through his willing sacrifice. He's the one who reigns not just over Narnia, but when you get to the last battle, he's the one who reigns over all the worlds. And C.S. Lewis uses the Aslan character to provide insight into the truth of Jesus and the power of the gospel. But Lewis was also very careful to never fully explain Aslan. While Aslan is presented as this lion figure who can be loved and trusted, Aslan is also described as a wild lion who cannot be tamed. When we hear that phrase, what do we think about Jesus? How often when we think about Jesus do we think about the wild nature? that cannot be tamed. Now, while we may be brought up as children with you know, images of Jesus being you know, a gentle, loving shepherd, saviour, who was there to love us, take care of us, we need to be careful that we do not lose the wild side of Jesus. Now, when we read the gospel stories, we need to understand that they are quite radical, they are quite revolutionary something that the Christian church lost sight of over the 1,500 years of Christendom when the Gospels were basically read in ways that reinforced the status quo of the church's power and authority. But if we are to engage with the Gospel stories in our post-Christendom society, then we need to actually be open to the radical message of Jesus. It's a message that flows through not just what Jesus had to say, but in what he also did in his interactions with people. And it's a radical message that is filled with the extravagant, transforming grace of God. And it continues to confront any behaviour or any attitude that diminishes the truth that all people are made in the image of God. Now, when we turn to our passage for this morning, we come to the second discourse in John's Gospel which is the longest conversation we have recorded uh, in the New Testament. And like the first discourse that we looked at last Sunday with the meeting between Nicodemus and Jesus, this second discourse, it starts with another personal encounter and conversation with Jesus. But this new encounter is more provocative and confronting than the one we looked at with Nicodemus. In order to appreciate the radical nature of this encounter and the teaching that Jesus gives, we need to look at the historical and social dynamics that surround this encounter that Jesus has with a Samaritan woman. Now, historically, the Jews and the Samaritans, they just basically despised each other. And we need to be aware of two key events that generated that intense hatred of each other. The first event goes back to 721 BC when the Assyrian army conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. As part of their conquest methodology, the Assyrians interbred the surviving Jewish remnant with people from other nations that had also been conquered by the Assyrians. And this mixed race, which was created by this exercise in genetics, is the race of people that we know as the Samaritans. Now, the Jews in the southern kingdom of Judah, who were spared the destructive power of the Syria, they treated the Samaritans as half-castes, religious outcasts. And as products of God's purging action of the southern kingdom of Judah with the Babylonian exile, the continuing Jewish communities in Palestine, which Jesus is living amongst, 
they continued to maintain their disparaging hatred of Samaritans. Now, the second event that fed the intense religious rivalry between Jews and Samaritans finds its roots in an action that took place in 128 BC at Mount Gerizim. The Samaritans had built their own cultic centre at Mount Gerizim as the centre for worship. It was a place loaded with historical significance. Now, back in Genesis chapter 12, you know, Abraham built his first altar at Shechem, which was at the base of Mount Gerizim. In Genesis 33, Jacob built an altar at the same place. And so the Samaritans saw Mount Gerizim as having greater historical significance and being a more sacred place for worship than Mount Zion in Jerusalem, which had only been established since David. Now the Samaritans claimed that their shrine at Mount Gerizim was the proper place for the worship of God and not the temple in Jerusalem. But the Asmonean Jews in Palestine disagreed with that claim. In 128 BC, they attacked and they destroyed the shrine at Mount Gerizim, an action that cemented the schism between the Jews and the Samaritans. Now, if we turn our attention to the social dynamics that were operating in Jewish society at the time of Jesus, we run to another set of contentious areas of life. You know, Jewish law had over time generated a two-class system based on gender. Men were given a superior position to that of women. And in terms of the religious education system, male religious teachers were to have no social contact with any other woman except their wives and daughters. Now, despite the creation narratives in Genesis 1 that affirmed the equality of men and women being made in the image of God, Jewish religious practice had created a system of inequality. And the patriarchy of Judaism had not only left women as second-class citizens in their religious structures, but they had entrenched that inequality with rules and traditions that made it impossible for women to rise above their second-class status. Now, with all that in background, let's just turn to what happens in John chapter 4. In verse 3, we read that Jesus leaves Judea to go back to Galilee. Now, in terms of geography, the direct journey from Jerusalem to Galilee will take you through Samaria. But most upright Jews would go east across the Jordan and travel north to Galilee on the eastern bank of the Jordan, the journey would take much longer, but it meant that they could avoid stepping into Samaria and encountering a Samaritan. So they would go the long route around. Now, Jesus could have done what every religiously upright Jew would do and avoid Samaria by crossing the Jordan River and taking up that eastern pathway. But Jesus intentionally chooses to go through Samaria. As it says there in verse 4, he had to go through Samaria. There is a divine purpose in what Jesus chooses to do. It is a radical and confronting purpose that reveals itself very quickly when Jesus and the disciples get to a town called Sychar where Jacob's well is located. Now, the fact that Jesus chooses to rest at Jacob's well introduces a number of new layers to what we perceive as the simple action of someone just trying to get some water. Because this well links us back to the patriarchal narratives in Genesis, which open up this action of Jesus to a deeper level. In Genesis 24, Abraham's servant stops at a well as a part of his search for a wife for Isaac. In Genesis 29, Jacob comes to this well in the middle of the day and meets Rachel, who will be his future wife. In Exodus chapter 2, Moses, who after fleeing Pharaoh in Egypt, comes to a well where he encounters Zipporah, who will be his future wife. And so in the Old Testament, a well is often a place for a meeting that ends in a betrothal. Now, in view of Jesus being identified back in John 2 as the bridegroom, there is a deeper level at work in this encounter at the well. 
Now the scripture in verse 6 that Jesus sat down at the well is understood as Jesus sitting on the stone covering of the well. This stone cover would need to be lifted in order for anyone to draw water from the well. But as Jesus sits in this position, we are invited to recall that in John 2, Jesus is identified as the new temple. And that connection takes us back to Ezekiel with the vision of the new temple from which the living water flows in Ezekiel 47. Now, all of these important Old Testament images flow into this encounter by Jesus with a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. This intentional act by Jesus has various layers of meaning that are now being fulfilled and which flow into the deeper teaching that will be given by Jesus. And so while the narrative in John 4 introduces us you know, to a tired Jesus who sits down at this well in the heat of the day, everything that follows is a revelation of the extravagant grace of God. And if we do not see this extravagant grace, then we are missing the message for this encounter. And so in the middle of the hottest part of the day, where the heat reflects off the dusty ground, you now anyone in their right mind would be indoors, out of the heat and resting. You now Jesus and the disciples have finally arrived at the well. Jesus is left alone while to rest while the disciples go into town to find some food. Well, it's into this stark image of solitude. A Samaritan woman walks who comes to draw water from the well. The fact that she's doing this at the hottest part of the day suggests that this woman lives with a social stigma. She is forced to come when no one else will be at the well. But imagine her surprise to find Jesus sitting there. And then the bigger surprise when Jesus asks her for a drink. You know, as John makes clear in verse 9, this Samaritan woman has a very clear appreciation of the social conventions that Jesus is now breaking. You know, Jews do not invite contact with Samaritans. Jewish men do not initiate conversations with unknown women. Yet here is Jesus making contact with a Samaritan woman and initiating a conversation. You know, clearly there is more going on here than just a request by a thirsty man for a drink. Because the man in question making the request is the incarnate God who has come to offer God's extravagant grace. You know, if Jesus was to allow the religious and social traditions of his Jewish society to control his actions, then he would have left Jacob's well at the first sight of this woman coming. But if Jesus left the well, he would be denying this woman the opportunity to encounter the extravagant grace of God. And so by choosing to speak with her, Jesus challenges all the prevailing religious cultural rules and he breaks through the barriers. Barriers devised by men who wanted to control and restrict access the grace of God. And this action by Jesus also challenges us to confront and break through the religious cultural barriers that we have created to prevent people accessing the extravagant grace of God. You know, throughout human history, those who hold religious power have always sought to put barriers around who is acceptable and who is not. And when we are in positions of social and religious privilege, we are often unaware of such barriers. We don't see how our religious structures are about power and controlling access to the divine. Now, this was a key aspect of life in Christendom, where social religious barriers based on fear were constructed. You know, the religious, they were afraid of being contaminated by the immoral. So they stopped them, the immoral, from accessing places where grace could be encountered. The religious were also afraid of losing power. And so they built institutional structures to put limits on who controlled access to the grace of God. And so what Jesus confronts us with in this encounter of the world 
is that a key function of being the people of God is to break down the barriers that stop people accessing the grace of God. You know, if we are maintaining structures and attitudes that deny the truth that we're all made in the image of God, then we are supporting barriers to God's grace. If Jesus will not allow that social and religious traditions of his society to restrict who can receive God's extravagant grace, then neither should we. We should not be a barrier. Now, having been provocative in his actions by encountering this Samaritan woman and talking with her, Jesus then moves on to being even more provocative by his words. In verse 10, where he says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, with this mention of living water, Jesus is doing a similar thing to what he did with the phrase born again. The term living water carries two meanings. The first meaning is a reference to spring water, such as you would get from a flowing stream. And this is the water that a person would drink ahead of any well water, because spring water is alive, it is fresh. But the second meaning refers to water that brings or creates life. And it's this meaning that Jesus wants the woman to pick up on. But it doesn't happen. The Samaritan woman can only interpret things according to her limited categories of understanding. And so when she hears Jesus talking about living water, she immediately thinks of water to drink and this situation of water that is in the well. Now, as this is Jacob's well, we need to be aware of some of the traditions about this well that are recorded in the Jewish Targum because they would have been a part of this woman's thinking as she engages in this conversation with Jesus. And according to the Jewish Targum, which is an explanatory translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, Jacob's well was a place of miracles. Now, when Jacob went to draw water, the water apparently in the well gushed and Jacob did not need a bucket to get water out of the well. And that water continued to gush out of the well for the next 20 years, thus being a wonderful source of what would be described as living water. And so responding out of what she knows, the Samaritan woman responds to this statement by Jesus by looking back to Jacob, the patriarch, who gave them the well, and comparing that to what Jesus is offering. And the unspoken message at this point being that the woman only sees a thirsty Jewish man and not someone who is greater than Jacob. But Jesus, as we know from reading through the first three chapters of John's Gospel, is not just a thirsty Jewish man. Jesus is the incarnate God, and therefore he is far greater than Jacob. And to stress this point, Jesus points out in verses 13 to 14 the nature of the water that he offers. He says, everyone who drinks this water, you know, the water in the well, they will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them, will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, as we said, according to the Jewish Targum, Jacob's well gushed for 20 years. That was seen as a miracle and a wonderful source of living water. But Jesus reveals that he is greater than Jacob because the living water that he gives will flow for more than 20 years. It will flow forever. And it will be the water that Ezekiel promised that would flow out of the new temple and renew creation. Because Jesus is the new temple and the water he offers is the living water promised by God. It is an expression of the extravagant grace of God. But this Samaritan woman is still limited by her own understanding of Jesus. Now, she can only think in terms of water that will satisfy her physical thirst. She can only think in terms of the traditions that surround Jacob's well. She only can think of a source of water that will just make her life easier and stop her having to come to this well every day in the hottest part of the day. Well, to encourage her further in her thinking, Jesus asks her in verse 16 to go and call her husband. 
And we should note that this request is not made by Jesus to shame this woman. It's not made to condemn her relationship failures. Jesus wants this woman to discover his true identity. And so in describing her five failed marriages and her current living arrangement, Jesus reveals to her that he is far more than just a thirsty Jewish man sitting at the well. And in terms of the deeper levels operating this encounter, the six failed relationships of this woman are like the six jars of water at the wedding of Cana. They're all symbols of the inadequacy of the old order of things. In terms of this woman and drawing on the images of betrothal symbolised at the well, Jesus is the seventh husband. He is the bridegroom. He is the bridegroom who will provide what this woman is looking for in all her relationships. Now, from her response in verse 19, it's clear that she's growing in her understanding of Jesus. And she now refers to him as a prophet. And doing so, she raises with Jesus the burning issue for all Samaritans, which is the acceptable place of worship. And as we noted earlier, one of the big points of tension between Jews and Samaritans was the place of worship. Now, it was at Mount Gerizim, as the Samaritans believed, or is it Mount Zion, as the Jews held out? Well, the answer that Jesus gives to that question is an interesting one. Not only does he reject the basis of the schism between the Jews and the Samaritans, but he reveals the true content and focus of worship. It's not about the place. It's not about the place of worship. It's about the person who is being worshipped. It's not about Mount Gerizim. It's not about Zion. It's about Jesus who is the incarnate God, who is the new temple of God. And so the true worship to be offered is to be in the spirit and in truth. And a hallmark of it is that it brings people together in the kingdom of God. Worship in the spirit and the truth does not pull people apart. Something I think churches have lost sight of in the way we've had all the worship wars. Worship in the spirit and truth brings people together in the kingdom of God. Now, this Samaritan woman has now heard all that Jesus has to say. Her understanding has grown with each new insight that Jesus has given. And so in verse 25, she raises the critical question for her faith in God. She believes that the Messiah is coming. She believes that when the Messiah comes, he will explain everything. And this is where we encounter the most radical moment in the ministry of Jesus. Out of all the people that Jesus could reveal his true identity, Jesus chooses this Samaritan woman. To a religious and social outcast to the Jews, to a social outcast to her own people, Jesus affirms that he is indeed the Messiah. It's of no great surprise that the Samaritan woman cannot keep to herself what she's just experienced. And so in verse 28, we read that she leaves behind her water jar. Now that should not be read as an act of forgetfulness by this woman. Leaving the water jar behind is a sign that her deeper thirst has now been quenched by the living waters of Jesus. She no longer needs the old order of things. And so this changed woman goes to the people in her village to witness to the truth of Jesus. She shares her story. But then she invites them, well, come and see Jesus for yourself and experience Jesus for yourself. Because this woman knows that it's not enough to simply know about this Jesus. This living water can only be experienced when we know Jesus personally. And one of the exciting sections of this entire story comes at the end where we read of the impact of this woman's testimony. Her witness inspires the entire village to invite Jesus to stay. And Jesus stays for another two days. And at the end of those two days, many more become believers not just because of what the woman said, 
but because of their own experience of Jesus. Now, this Samaritan woman and her village were seen by the Jewish religious community as unacceptable outcasts from God. The extravagant grace of God has again smashed the barriers of religion and men to enable an outcast to know the truth of Jesus and be transformed by this truth. You know, for Jesus, this is an example of the harvest of the kingdom that is taking place. Well, as we finish this this morning, this transformation, this encounter, gives us cause for some reflection. And I just want to raise some questions for you, for you to continue to think about throughout the rest of this week and the rest of your life. How open are we to God using people that do not fit our acceptable categories to reveal his truth to our lives? Now, how open are we of God speaking to us through people that we despise, we look down on, we don't think you're acceptable? How many churches today would allow, let alone invite, a woman such as this Samaritan woman, five husbands living in, to come and speak the truth of Jesus? How open are we to allowing that to happen? And then thirdly, are there groups of people that we treat as being unworthy of the grace of God? and of speaking the truth of Jesus. You know, what are your prejudices, your attitudes to others who may be different from you? Are you open to seeing them as God sees them and treating them as being worthy of the grace of God? You know, Jesus is loving and merciful. And we like that part of Jesus. But Jesus is also very confronting. The extravagant grace of God continues to challenge all our attitudes, all our traditions. Because we are not to be a barrier to the grace of God. We are supposed to be an instrument of that grace. Not always a comfortable task. But this is the work of the kingdom of God. And it's the work that never stops. As Jesus says, open your eyes. Look at the fields. And those fields are very diverse. But they are ripe for harvest. Are we open to being engaged? Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you that You do confront, you do stir. We may not like it. We may not like being made to feel uncomfortable. But Lord, we need to really grapple with what your grace is all about. And we need to understand the beauty of your grace in our own lives and to share that same beauty with people who may not be the beautiful people the people who may be so different from us we have no idea how to speak to them, who may live lives that are the very antithesis of how we live. But each one is made the image of God and they need to know your grace. So challenge us, stir us, all those things, so that we may engage in your harvest for the kingdom. And we pray this in your name. Amen.